So my name is Litton, and I serve as a director of Blockchain Labs. I want this to be interactive. I have just about 400 slides, and I have 45 minutes. So it'll be like, I'm just joking. I have, I have only 10. But I want this to be more interactive, and I'll, I'll walk you through a demo. And this is something that we have done for ourselves, right? So let me get a few things out of the way. Why am I going to bring this? Besides the fact there's a whole lot of opportunity behind blockchain, is that if you look at blockchain at the very heart of it, some of the questions that you bring up from the experience that you've had in use cases, and we'll discuss a whole lot of use cases that I'm, I'm involved. I've met close to 300 different clients, had 100 workshops plus, for defining those use cases and, and, and understanding as to if blockchain applies for it. So my first question, if someone were to bring up blockchain, you know, can we do this? And then my question would be, why blockchain? So my whole structure of this presentation is to walk you through that journey of what we have done and help you understand as to some of the fundamental tenets of blockchain, right? And feel free to ask any questions, why are we doing it? What is the business benefit of it? But let me just, before I go into demos, talk about why is, why are, why is Alien doing it? So how many of you have heard of Alien? <laughs> that's, that's a good start for participation, right? And, and we've been in transition business since inception of transition business. So mainframe, web 3 Z, DB2, CICS, the entire gamut of our 40, by the way, 43,000, 200 plus software products that we have. And the, the entire gamut of these products are meant for transition systems, which means you go to a bank, you go to an insurance company, you go to a retailer, you're dealing with a whole lot of transactions, right? And we are, we are building these scalable software to be able to deal with e-businesses, moving from what we have done in CICS and mainframe in the past. So transaction is our business. And if blockchain were to be the next generation transaction system, then we are as much disrupted as our financial services counterparts or customers, right? So this is the financial services banks, some of the stuff that Michael talked about, who are potentially affected by this technology, we are equally affected if this becomes the next generation system of record, which is what we use databases for, and transaction systems. Today, which we use a gamut of technology to ensure that a transaction goes through, right? Which brings me to the next question. What is a transaction? Since this is a payment conference, what is a transaction? Anyone? To sell a stock, like from my, like. That is a example of a transaction. Okay. But what fundamentally is a transaction? An exchange. An exchange of, of, of something that you are reflecting a chain, and either the chain goes through or it doesn't go through. There's no in between. There's no gray area. It's a very atomic state, as we call it, right? Which means if, things, if all things go well, the transaction should go through, it should be committed. And if not, then I'm going to roll back everything else. There's no in between state. Now, this is, a, this is something which we're going live with in about two months. I didn't know this till we actually joined the... So I've been at blockchain for two and a half years uh, from an enterprise perspective. And I've, I've done close to 160 experiments with Bitcoin. And there's a whole lot of appeal to it. There's a whole lot of cool miners to it. But there's a big divide between what Bitcoin does, what enterprise can do. right? And I'll, I'll, I'll try to expand that in this four minutes that I have. But when we looked into this whole thing, we realized that I didn't know this, but IBM apparently sell, you know, lends $44 billion a year. This is our IBM Global Financing Division. So think of us as a car company, which obviously we're not. But when you buy a car, you get 0% financing, right? And so to sell our software services, we do the same thing for our clients, where if you have an IT project or you have a, a, a business <coughs> project, we say, you know what, if you were to buy our software hardware services, we'll finance this whole thing for four years, and depending on the terms. And that goes through three different entities. So I want you to, in your mind, think about three participants in a network. You asked me about performance. This relates to some of the stuff that we talk about now. Right? The, three, the three entities are, how do I get rid of this again? Which is interesting, because blockchain is enormously technical. There you go. <laughs> and then we talk about you know, presentation issues. So we have suppliers, we have partners, and we have global finance. So there are cases where IBM we supply our own hardware, we supply our own software, right? In many cases, the project may require Cisco routers, right? And we agree to finance the project. So in most cases, you may have multiple partners and multiple suppliers. Partners, we have about 9,000 different business partners. So there are in engagements where it's too expensive for IBM to engage directly, so we go through our smaller business partners, and they bring the business to us, and they help us finance the structure of the deal, and we say, you know what, we'll finance it because it makes, it makes sense for us to do it, and it helps us sell our software and hardware services. So you have three entities where I think global finance is in the center of it. We lend $44 billion a year, right? And we have about 3 million plus invoices, which means 3 million sort of transactions that we do on a yearly basis. So we don't really care for 10,000 TPS, as you were referring to. We just want to make sure that we have a system that works. If you look at it, 
at any given point in time, between those three, three different entities, there's an issue on visibility, which, uh, which sort of has our $100 million tied up at any given point in time. So for, for 44 days, we are dealing with disputes of some sort. So for example, we, we ship our computers to a company that's operating in New York, but the data center happens to be New Jersey, for example, across the river. But what happens in that case is when we do that, there's a small discrepancy of state tax. Now that small line item is going to cost us 44 days for a certain amount of money for the invoice amount to be stuck until that dispute is resolved, which means that we have financed it, the goods have shipped, but we're not receiving money from it. What does that do for the business? So if I have $100 million a company stuck, what is that problem called? Liquidity. Correct. So I'm, 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 that's the opportunity cost that I cannot leverage, right? And so what we had to do is we had an average dispute invoice about 31, not a much, uh, not a huge amount, but given that we have 3 million invoices, collectively adds up to $100 million. So then we had to do a few things. And <clears throat> go back here. What we've done initially is we took all those invoices and transactions and put them in blockchain. So what you see here are three different parties. And each of them are blocks. And we add, we're adding blocks. This is a live system running for Kepsi New York. Where what we're doing today, we call this a shadow chain. And the reason why is because, imagine this, we started this last year. So for us to negotiate and get all those 9,000 partners and 6,000 suppliers on the same blockchain is going to be a Herculean task. Right? So what we've done is we've taken our existing transaction systems, put that data into this blockchain format for us to have visibility and transparency. Right? So suddenly I have visibility into what has been approved, what's rejected, what's a problem. And what this does for me is it does a few interesting things for me. If I look at this stuff, it gives me the ability. Remember, Michael talked about chain blocks. So these are essentially data blocks that in traditional databases are spread all over the map. But here, I'm chaining every transaction. So whatever happens is being built upon the previous transaction, which allows me to sort of give me a sprawl of data and have, give me visibility of what's happening. So I click on one of these dots, and it's not very clear here. But these dots represent partners and suppliers. So the purple dot are suppliers, and, and, and the turquoise blue are, are partners. right? So if I click on any of these, it tells me, for example, click on this that I have a partner or supplier, and I have the entire visibility to the whole process of where things are. So what I'm doing essentially is taking the data from my existing trans transaction system, putting on blockchain, allowing me to give me the entire visibility. And somebody actually, you asked me what's the notion of a smart asset, right? You were asking, Michael. And there are industries, for example, FDA, uh, for Food and Drug, uh, Drug Administration, passed a law called DQSA, which is uh, I know this, I've read the whole law, I know what DQSA stands for, it's something to do with security, quality and, Drug Quality and Security Act, passed two weeks back, which requires the industry, the pharma industry, to have provenance, which airlines have been doing this for like 30 plus years. So every nut and bolt in airline has to go through a historical you know, provenance of where the material comes from. This notion of conflict minerals, which is a big deal in airline industry. So that at times, you have stuff at the go-down that cannot be used only because they have no idea the source of that material, right? So those are some of the use cases you realize that blockchain, the example that Michael gave from Diamond's perspective is, those examples manifest themselves like today, the one sure way to do, do some of these elements from a use case perspective is, like DQSA, for example, that all our drug that's, that's now being manufactured in the United States has to ensure that they have the source of the material coming all the way and there's a, there's, a, uh, there's a known source of everything that goes into a drug. So in many cases, you'll find that in this case, we were able to look at every state and see where things are, who's a partner, who's a supplier, and we had to anonymize the data for demo purposes. Supplier 389, what happened with this transaction? We had the full visibility of transaction in one single, and these are all coming from different blocks. If I were to eventually go back, here. Sorry, the networking is, anyway, while this painting uh, the picture, it gives me the ability to map the suppliers, partners, because I have all the data amalgamated in one single place, right? So the whole idea of some of these things that we are doing here is to be able to, I think, the, so it's running an IBM network, which means I have to go through a VPN to connect to it. 
and for some reason we lost the VPN. So just give me two minutes while it comes up. It's just a short demo and then I'm gonna to move to some of the esoteric elements that I want to discuss. So, so Nathan, while you're saying that, when you said you put the entire, your, your invoice chain yep. into yep. Block, uh, a block bank, yep. obviously it's private, correct? Right? Today it's private, yes. And, um, and what was the payload set? I mean, yeah. So let me first, now that it's back, I'll, I'll table that question for a few minutes. Right? So what, what we did in this case was, we realized if we had the solution, we could reduce this entire process by three days. So 44 days, 100 million to three days, still pretty good. But in ideal scenario, if I had all the supplies and all the partners a single chain, can anyone guess what the resolution time should be? You all, all you have to do is guess, it can be right or wrong. 30 minutes. Almost instant, right? Only because of the fact that all the parties have visibility. Today, how do we do things, right? For example, there's a problem with the, uh, with the invoice. We're making phone calls like, hey, where's the money? You know, you coded this taxing wrong, you're to regenerate the invoice. All that is happening over the phone and some electronic media scan documents. Only, and it's not just our problem. This is pretty much the entire procurement and, and supply chain problem where these things are still running even though we have digitized assets. We have scanned copies of these things. They are still have to be humanly coordinated, right? What we're trying to do in, in, in many of these cases is ensure that once we take that exact ex existing transactional output into the blockchain element of it, all the parties who are on the chain have visibility to it. And the visibility has, has a power to it. And we'll discuss the downside of it as well, right? The fact that you're dealing with a bank, I don't want my transaction to be visible to all parties. We have solutions for that as well. But in this case, visibility of these transactions allows us to say, you know, business part 945, there has been a dispute and we have to resolve it. And the reason why we're able to understand this is that we have the linkages between the partner and the supplier, and we know what really is going on only because we're able to put this in a single system. We're using the word shadow chain for this, only because for this to be truly blockchain, I have to have all this different party on a network. Somebody asked the question about network versus data. I think it was you who asked. So they are interlinked. Network gives you the notion of trust, and data sort of extends that notion of trust using some of the elements of blockchain. So let me pause here. And did it make sense? This is training, it's not a presentation, right? Okay, let me go back to this. So let me go over, once this comes up, okay. Some of the, again, I only have 10 slides, so I'm just gonna walk through some of the elements. The fundamental unit, so the way I structure is what, why, and how, right? So how is later on, we'll talk about so what we're doing, what the industry is doing, what collectively we as consortiums and, and, and different people are doing different things. But I just wanna be able to go back to basics and take a step back and build upon what Michael was talking about from Bitcoin perspective. Leisure, right? Fundamental sort of unit of whatever we do. So how do you record assets in your enterprise? And this is where you talk about me either accepting money, receiving money, moving assets, right? So we use transaction as a mechanism to control the asset, which means that the notion of double spend that Michael was talking about, you cannot have two entries in two different books. And today you have systems in place to ensure that it doesn't happen, which consumes time, right? So for example, when you buy a stock, you get the confirmation on the next day, right? That you pretty much, you think you have to stock for the next day, but the whole process takes about anywhere between four days to a week for the actual transfer of that asset to happen in some back office system, which is maintained by an entity called DTCC, for example. And then you have contracts. Contract essentially is the fact that, yes, I'm buying a stock which costs me X amount of money. The contract says that I cannot transfer the stock till I actually receive the money. So that's sort of a sort of contract. Same thing with mortgages, same thing with anything of value that we, that we transfer over the net. Then we look at this contractual obligation between the fact that I'm transferring an asset and in, in, in return, something else has to go because the books have to balance. Right? Because I cannot buy a house and not pay for it. So somebody has to get paid at the, other, at the other end. So these two entities are interchangeably used a lot. These three terms, you'll find a whole lot discussed in blockchain world. The notion of ledger is nothing but an entry of a data. You know? whether it's digitized form or into a, what we call a database of sorts, right? That's, a, that's an entry form. Transaction is the notion of ensuring that there is some sort of a trust in the system. That if I'm writing that transaction, that exchange using a smart contract, for example, then there's the, the element of, the, the two elements are satisfied. 
point, allows, that allows me to sort of move my asset from point, point A to point B. Now, what happens in blockchain world, which is what Bitcoin explain, what uh, Michael explained in Bitcoin world is, today you have multiple entities, right? And uh, we use the term disintermediation quite a bit, right? You have multiple entities that, that provide a certain trust element to us. So if I go to a bank and I want to transfer money, uh, how many of you are in payment world here? Right. How many of you are from payment world? How many of you are in financial? This is a payment problem. Right? Payment world, yeah. How many of you are from financial services? Non-financial services. I'm asking you this only because there are some examples that I, that I want to give uh, which would make sense. But let's uh, give an example of money transfer. When I transfer, by the way, the $600 billion gets transferred across the globe. So there's a whole lot of friction. Anywhere between 9 to 18% of that money goes into fees. It takes one week for me to move money. And I've done like 160 different experiments sending money from here to Europe, to Asia. Good luck sending some money to Bangladesh when you don't, don't know somebody there. And you can have all kinds of flags that will go off. Right? Now, what happened in that case is that when I transfer money from, let's say, JP Morgan Chase to my bank, JP Morgan Chase has a relationship with corresponding banks. Right? Each of those banks are providing a service of trust. I trust my bank, my bank trusts a different bank, they trust uh, its own correspondent bank in the country, and that cycle continues of trust. So essentially what's happening in the system is I'm moving my ledger entry from point A to point B, and that takes time. I'm giving the money, and every time somebody is moving the ledger entry from, from their system to a different system, they're taking a fee for it. And that's why sometimes it's anywhere between 9 to 18% of your pain. And by the way, 2% of our entire GDP is going into the opacity of data. We don't know how things work, whether it's you know, thin, moving things of value, cost us money in, in form of transmission cost. And this, this sort of the basic fundamental elements of moving these ledger entries, moving the assets from multiple ledger entries is what's costing the system money and time. So two things, I might, in my opinion, if you look at the litmus test, we try to solve two things with blockchain, trust and time. Time, because this whole cycle, depending on how many participants you have in the network, simply takes more time for you to move these things, and each entity wants to ensure that they do due diligence and they want to charge a fee for doing, you know, for doing so. And trust is the fact that if I were to create a system like this, which is what's happening today, that if I have to move money between two parties, there are multiple counterparties involved in between who are acting as a trust intermediary. They, they're providing a level of trust. And there, and you have this hodgepodge, and, and Swift is a perfect example, collection of all the certain banks who go and you have this network, and you could take any financial instrument. You can take stocks, you can take bonds, you can take OTCs. Each one of them has to go through this inefficient, expensive, and vulnerable process. Right? But mind you, whatever we're doing today, we're doing this on a network that was built for information. Right? And that's why you start beginning to see vulnerabilities if you heard about what's happened with the you know, Bank of Bangladesh and, and the fraud of skimming and they blame the US Fed government. Have you heard of that, that case, right? So the whole thing is that you start seeing the inefficiency and vulnerability of the information networks <coughs> that is causing the problem and this, we believe the soul is, is, is inefficient. So how do we solve this problem, right? Because now, every time a counterparty talks to a different counterparty, it's a point-to-point -point transaction. System itself has no visibility to it. So how many of you have actually tried sending money abroad? You have. Have you tried to call and find out where your money is? No, no. Okay, try it next time. Send the money and you can pretty much kiss your money goodbye because they'll give you a swift code. Now I, I work in the industry so I know what it is. But you cannot do jack with a swift code. You simply have to rely on the system to work and open inquiry and that can take months. And I've done those experiments too. Go ahead. Where is the clearance? Do this is today's system, right? So, for example, if my bank has to transfer money to its correspondent bank, they're transferring money using some sort of wire protocol, right? Now, that bank has to, and so you have wiring instructions. The Swift has their own instruction in terms of what is the destination bank. So you have source and you have destination, and all these intermediaries will have their own networks, which may or may not interface with Swift. So the point is, every time I send money from J.P. Morgan to banks, say. Bank of New York Mellon, Bank of New York Mellon sends to a bank in, in England, for example, each of them have their own books, which means that this relationship between this bank and that bank is not known by us. Right. There's no transparency, right? But how does it happen on the blockchain? Yes, I'm getting to that. So what we're trying to solve with the problem is that if we had a shared ledger, so we use the word distributed ledger technology or shared ledger technology, 
we have a shared ledger, which means that suddenly now I have not a hodgepodge of disconnected networks. I have a single network. And please state the word single network with a grain of salt, because there's a whole lot of complexity with it. That if all the entities have access to shared ledger, remember the ledger, which is a big spreadsheet or digitized version of the old ledger that we used to use, then if a counterparty A wants to send money to counterparty B, for example, then that transaction should happen between them and all the parties should know. But what's the problem with that? What's the problem with this model where everybody has access to the same ledger? So you, you agree with me so far that this model is broken, it's expensive, and this model where suddenly now I know I have a massive ledger, I have everybody's permission entities and I can move money across and everybody has visibility and access to the ledger data. What's the problem? too many intermediaries there? Is that the problem? No, I mean we can always, so some will go away, some will have a new role, like so travel agents don't exist anymore, but we still have Expedia, we have Travelocity and Trimago and all these guys, right? So the, the roles will form. What's the problem with this model? It's not a big tender, it's not a final settlement, and there's no privacy. Okay, let's say I solve all those technically. What is still the problem? It's not legal. It's not legal? No. It's not legal. How do, you, how do you make that claim? This is not final settlement. Final settlement is when a bank transfers funds, good funds. Correct. So let me table that for a minute because there is a settlement element of this that has to follow later on. My question here is that if everybody has access to the same data, what's the fundamental <coughs> problem with it? We get the whole technicality of the movement of money. But what's the fundamental problem if everybody has access to the same data? Any of them could change it? Correct. Anybody can change it. Right. So to prevent that, and settlement goes a bit later, to make sure the transition goes through, I want to make sure that I have systems in place to, this is what we call a trust system or consensus, that there has to be some mechanism in place that prevents from anybody from changing the data, which means, going back to Michael's assertion earlier, that if party C changes the data, the fact that all the changes are immutable, which means I have a historical context of it, lends itself to trust, which means we know who changed what. Second thing is if one party changes the data, which assuming there's a, there's a transaction between there are two parties involved, then there has to be some mechanism in the system that agrees upon the change. And that's what we call trust system, which is the heart of blockchain. And so all the stuff that you're talking about in terms of how do I ensure the scalability, performance, all the technical elements of it, I usually table that and look to the clients for later on. We try to figure out as to what's the best trust mechanism that we institute. Because without trust, this is nothing. Without trust, you're simply creating a distributed database of sorts, which we've been have, we've had for 30 plus years. Right. Now, that leads to the fact that once I've figured out the appropriate or apt consensus model, which is the agreement of the party for them to record a transaction, and the transaction is recorded, then comes the downstream business activities, like clearing and settlement. Like, which means the transaction now is final. The finality of transaction means that I have taken, I have, the transaction is committed, I've written the transaction to the ledger, and that transaction is final, which means I cannot go back to it. So this argument, the religious debate with what happened with DAO, with Ethereum was that if it's immutable, then who gives anybody the right to go back to it later on? Right. Now, if there's anything you should take away from this training or from my session for 45 minutes, let me know, because I tend to speak a lot is this is the four. So there are 4,000 different companies in the world all proposing to be blockchain, uh, from a high school team of five people to mid and large size corporation. Any blockchain solution in the fold has these four basic building blocks. You have shared ledger, which is nothing but the distributed database that we looked at earlier, right? And you have plethora of technologies to enable that, to ensure that all these different parties have <coughs> access to data. You know about transition visibility, we do have what we call fractal visibility or partial visibility where we can enable and enable key mechanism where not all the data is visible to everybody else. So we can solve some of those elements technically from that perspective. We look at privacy. Transaction finality and verification transaction is an important element of it. Which means that if I'm in a banking network and I'm transacting with bank B, uh, the remaining bank should not be able to see the transaction. So how do we prevent that from happening and still maintain the privacy and confidentiality of that transaction and not give away the other elements mm -hmm. of the competitive advantage that banks have, which is knowing me as an individual. Look at smart contracts, and I don't like the word smart contract because <coughs> it's only dependent on the person writing it. So we use the word chain code. Essentially, it's nothing but 
code that's running on blockchain, which adheres to some of the principles of blockchain, right? So every time a code executes, it it means that I'm taking some sort of you know transaction, subjecting to some uh, a set of business rules, and eventually that business rule ends up right into the ledger, which means that many of these are business terms. Now, interestingly enough, you find the notion of contract, which implies legality. And today, the industry itself is not ready to actually have legal contracts running on these things. So today, we have sort of a business rules, essentially, encoding these smart contracts. I think we'll spend some time talking about panel discussion, the challenges of looking at that from, the, from, you know, from a legal perspective. You look at consensus. Consensus, again, the heart of blockchain, uh, which, again, you have three fundamental ways of achieving consensus at a very scientific level. One is masterless, which means nobody's a master, a Bitcoin vault. Everybody has to agree. Massively computationally expensive. This is where I think this whole energy equation that you talked about, Michael, how much energy it takes, the inefficiency of the public networks, all that is a major mess, right? Which makes it less consumable for the enterprise. And then you have multi-master, which means that in a network, you need to have what we call Byzantine type problems, where you have multiple sort of entities who are tasked with trusted entities who are tasked to sort of commit a transaction. And then you have essentially the notion of a single master which becomes a challenge where if you have one master, you don't want to give all the power to one process in the network, so you sort of create a mechanism that rotates the power. So you have these three fundamental, and I don't want to go into the technicality of it, but understand that this is the heart of it, which means that all the time that I expend after we identify a use case from a client on figuring out the science behind it. But the first thing is the business element of it, figuring out as to what use case makes sense for blockchain. Why is it relevant for our business? Um, three things. Um, and I give Uber example a lot. And you'll find FinTech world is we talk about Uberization of financial services quite a bit. But it has to be cheaper, faster, better. But in many cases, we want to make sure that, again, saving time, right? <laughs> the ability for us to be able to do things in a blockchain world which saves us time in, in financial world and non-financial world time is money in many cases. Removes cost. Um, we do, I have written a paper on this um, on blockchain in the platform for disintermediation. There are many tenants to it that if we have this network of trust, which pretty much the entire financial industry is built upon, and if I embed that trust in the network, then there are some parties that go away. Right? And so if you look at blockchain, we always draw an analogy between information networks, which is what we call internet, and blockchain is the foundational tent for internet of value. Right? So what information have done for, for, for information networks we expect that blockchain has the potential to enable that platform that allows us to exchange things of value fairly seamlessly, faster, better, and at a much cheaper rate. Right? Which means that if I have to refinance a mortgage, which by the way, it's a, I've spent six months on this use case, is it should cost you 260 bucks. For it cost me 6%. Because I have all these intermediaries involved. I don't have to do revalidation of your titles of many of the checks that I have to do today. Only because system that we have created requires refinancing process to be treated like a new mortgage. And they're all the downstream activities from securitization to servicing and so on and so forth. So those are the few things that we want to be able to eliminate, and that's true for pretty much any transaction you're doing in financial services. And I'll walk into some of the, some of the work that we're doing. And reduce risk. Uh, again, remember, trust is an important currency. Right? And the fact that each of these blocks are immutable, that whatever you write is final, and whatever you write on top of it is final, you have a historical context. Think of shared cost of KYC AML, which any bank is probably spending 25% of their operating budget on these compliance type issues. So you find many of the fundamental technology elements of blockchain around provenance, historical context, all the stuff that, that Michael talked about, lends itself to the trust mechanism that we're building. That even if someone cheats in the system, the beauty of that DAO problem is that the 165 million and eventually what 51, 56 million was ciphered off, uh, it, was, it, was, it was seen in a, in a instantly. So, so the, the, the entire community saw something wrong with this. So we didn't have to, we didn't have to you know, wait till Bernie Madoff manifests this eight years later. The community knew, of course it's wrong, but we knew it instantly. Right? It's, it's not the fault of Ethereum or, or, or the underlying blockchain, <coughs> it's the fault of the DAO that was devised using the technology components. So, to me, this part that I'm talking about, when we decide, when we work with our clients in terms of what that business network should look like, we have to inherently induce the notion of risk and trust in the system, because that's what we're building. We're building a trusted network of sorts. Um, Does each chain that it's on have its own contract? 
Um, interesting question. Clarify that a little bit. <clears throat> In other words, it sounds like each type of chain has its own contract that they, that they agree to, all the parties agree to. So let me draw a picture for you because I'll help you understand. So let's say we have a business network of multiple entities, right? So this is like a business network and I create a transaction. So the notion of smart contract, the chain, so blocks you nothing but a log of transactions. It's chained because as the chain grows, you cannot go back and change this chain because the moment you change anything here, it renders the entire chain. So you, 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 the, the integrity of the chain is maintained by the what you call block height. So these are nothing but record of transactions. Now, smart contracts, or chain code as we call it, are, can be here, which means that if I'm exchanging, if I'm moving a transaction from point A to point B, then they, before I accept a transaction, I have, to, I have to ensure that it has to go through my business rules. That I want to make sure that it has the right contract ID, if I can verify this, if I have the right, so for, for example, mortgage. For me to accept a mortgage and, and render your mortgage as paid, I have to make sure that you at least pay the minimum required. Or, or else, I will not accept the transaction. So these are some of the rules that we have to induce. And so you can do a few things. You can induce rules at, at the business unit level, or you can induce so these these chain code to create assets. And as these as as the chain code sort of accepts the transaction, it creates a block. And to be able to write this block, it goes through some sort of consensus mechanism, which is an agreement between multiple parties to agree the transaction. So like a two or three step process that you go through. Does that help? So, so rules can be added during the process. Correct. Now there are mechanisms. Remember, we we devise the new world we're creating. You devise a mechanism and permission world as to who can define the rules and where you can deploy the rules. Which means that if it's my business, I don't want J.P. Morgan Chase to deploy rules on Bank of New York Mellon's behalf, right? So they can only control their sort of the rules of accepting the transaction when it comes to them as a business entity on the network. Or you can devise a mechanism which says that, for example, music industry, right? Uh, we work with them, like the, there are two in the US, the big ones, and every country has PRO, which is the performance rights organization, which is the, whatever you do or sell, you buy, you have to go to that particular entity. Um, it's a single network with single business problem. So they can define a set of rules up front going into the network, which can remain static, like the DAO <coughs> problem with it, right? Does that help? Uh, when you go to QA, I'll be happy to be more illustrious yeah. in that, that yeah. process. Right. So these are some of the use cases that we looked at. Uh, some of them are very sexy, I mean, they're cool, they sound really cool. Like for example, you look at uh, trade financing, the trillion dollar problem, but enormously complex problem. Right? You have three different layers of, of entities who are involved in it. This is the work we've done 18 months, and we realized that this is sort of the path, and we want, this is the holy grail of what we want to get into, the high market value of transactions, trading exchanges, uh, stocks, bonds, derivatives, OTCs, the, the entire gamut of the CDSs, for example, the credit default swaps. But we are, we are starting from here because one, these are this is what we've done for our own use case, right? Real time view, some of the compliance ledger, AML, KYC type stuff. Because the risk is fairly low. The risk is low, the returns are fairly normal, it's a well understood problem, and there's no real exchange of assets actually happening. But as you go up, so this is consortium shared ledger, which means that you can have a shared ledger for trade exchanges, for example, a shared ledger for mortgages, and shared ledger for, because they have a single asset type. They have a business language that the industry understands, which is relevant to the smart to your question, that I cannot start exchanging stocks in a mortgage network because it's a completely different business paradigm. So you start seeing emergence of cons consortium networks for payments, cross-border payments, retail banking, and so on and so forth. And eventually we start, again, from the work that we're doing in mid-2017, we'll start seeing some of these sort of use cases emerging in terms of exchanging things of value, asset exchanges. Right. Uh, what market has done, for example, in New York, and what Settle has done in terms of creating this, the CSE type platforms. Right. This is where we are seeing sort of heading in. So most of our companies who are working are working in this space because it's low risk, inherently makes sense operationally to use the cost of two billion, the $20 billion number that Michael shared in terms of <coughs> the Santander Bank disclosing it, is really towards reducing the operational cost of duplicate different redundant systems that we have running in the back office. But the holy grail is in these two areas. 
So that's where we're heading. That eventually, you selling and buying assets should be as simple as you sending an email, because you don't care for geography. And there's a system in place that handles the email, it rejects the email if you don't have an account. So you have all these protocols being built. We are trying to build the same protocol using blockchain for things of value exchange. So some of the things that we look at, regulators, again, this is an important, very funny and good conversation to have with, you know, with the regulators. <coughs> Their role changes in this space, right? And I'll, uh, I'll expand on that when we go to the panel part of it. Industry groups, this is very important that the role of this, so you know about private ledgers, I think the vision of blockchain is business networks, because in absence of business network, you're simply creating a technology play for solving internal problems. Right? So a few things around what it is not, I don't want, for example, tech, at a technical level, client wants to say, let me replace my existing messaging system, let me replace my existing database, and that's not the intent. Blockchain is not meant to rip and replace a single piece of tech. It's really meant to sort of <coughs> institute a new business model of having this notion of trade, trust, ownership built into a business network, as opposed to saying, you know what, can I do this better with blockchain? And when the conversation pops up, I always question my clients, like, why blockchain? Why do you want to do this with blockchain? Why can't I do this with a database or a shared database? Right. Because we've had these tech. We've had all the concrete technology in blockchain for over 30 years. So cryptography, since inception of computing, shared ledger, we've had databases for 30 plus years. We've had consensus, which is the, like, the mechanism we agree upon something in a cloud world. So we have, we've had all this for 30 plus years. And if all this goes into blockchain now, what, why, why does it make it cool? Anybody? If we've had all this tech for all, collectively, I'm, I'm suggesting here that all blockchain companies have, are building upon this and changing a few things and calling it blockchain for this. But at the very heart of it, we have these four basic fundamental building blocks. And each one of these components have existed for over two decades. Is it the speed of the components, uh, computing power now versus Go 20 on. years ago? Yeah. And storage increases? I think it's something that's simply economics. I mean, things are cheaper now for us to go through the transaction mechanism. And you're right, we've made enough advancement for me to be able to store a lot more information at less density, use less power to do so, and make it economical enough for me to achieve it. And that's why I think in many cases we are at an inflection point where blockchain actually makes sense you know, that, that we can achieve it. And that's why I believe that this public, your question of public networks, we use blockchain are inherently inefficient because public networks are inefficient to begin with because they are meant for exchanging small bits of information, right? And so if you're, if you're using the same inefficient network to think change things of value, you're going to drive the same inefficiencies that we are seeing in the information exchange. So that's something to remember as we are de de designing the systems at a technical level as to what really makes sense. So I just want to make a, a point here to you ask why now. There's a little bit of uh, just a moment in time a lot, of, a lot of systems architecture that we run on today is 20 plus years old. And suddenly we've got this thing that it appears in the eyes of a board to be kind of sexy, right? And really appealing and new and, and technologically innovative. And I get the sense that actually there's a whole momentum behind, let's just kind of digitize old fashioned processes and let's call it blockchain, let's try and incorporate some of these elements. It is just a moment in time when big infrastructure systems need to be replaced. This appears sure. to be the next best time. Is that fair? No, that's fair. That's fair assessment because we always get this debate. So we've had this thing of business process management. So a few things that you've saw seen in the demo too. It's nothing but taking a business process and collapsing into a single layer. And in many cases, that those systems become so inefficient that these things are time to now rip and replace it. The only challenge is ROI. How do we define the cost? The cost of doing it because it's still emerging tech. So that's where we get stuck, that everybody recognizes the need for replacing and changing the way we're doing things, right? But it's hard to justify the cost behind it, because now we don't have the models that we have. So if you look at any book on ID economics, we've had defined models on how do we justify the cost of maintenance versus software acquisition versus you know, long term. And we have this mathematical model that, that all the actualists can, can define it. Blockchain, I think, is still going to that, to that level of maturity. So I believe that once you have two or three successful projects that will give birth to these models, which I'm expecting by 2017 mid to start seeing some, some, some viable projects like surface up in the market and say, okay, you know what, we've done this with blockchain, it makes sense. So a few things around this, right? Blockchain for business. What are we doing about it? 
there are no standards in blockchain, zero standards. So imagine, you know, we built TCP IP as a primary protocol to communicate. Then we built different protocols, HTTP, Telnet, FTP. You have all these different protocols, which allows you to exchange large files, allow you to be able to have, you know, connect to other systems. That protocol lacks. So if you're trying to fundamentally create and shift this trust mechanism in, on, on the net, then we have to define that. So we had to launch, we were one of the founding members of Hyperledger project to be able to rally up the technology and the business industry to come, come on board with us. Question? Yeah, when you talked about zero standards over recently where there's a proposal for the ISA yep. and ANSI is asking yep. for comments yep. aside from ANSI's position. Do we need a standard quickly uh, so that everybody can get on board comfortably or do we kind of keep it wild, wild west? No, I certainly don't think my well rest, at least in the enterprise world, will fly, only because in banking, financial, all the regulated industries that we work with, healthcare, financial, and retail, has a small thing on regulation, and the wild well rest doesn't work well with the regulated environment. Yeah. That'll be questions three, four, five. Yes, so I will, I will address that from ANZ, ANZ and from ISO and from Hyperledger, and, and so there are, there's a prong of effort going on, even from the W3, for example, right? I'm personally involved in some of those conversations, so I'm happy to. Um, from the standpoint of IBM without giving out too much information, but I suspect that there's a lot of saving down the road, yep. but building it up, it must have been, or it, yep. in terms of cost and I mean, experts, yep. development and all that. Yep. Um, can you give some perspective? Yes, I'm going to do that actually. Um, so this is what I'm going to do in what we're doing in these two areas. So it's a very good point, because what happens is if you look at, I'm going to switch between the slides here, how many of you are actually technical in the room? How many of you are technical in the room who get some basic fundamentals? So if you look at each of these boxes, right, shared ledger is nothing but, and I'll, I'm not answering your question, it's a long way to answer, we need to understand what's happening behind it. Uh, shared ledger is nothing but this notion of da this data blocks keep growing. And as they grow, remember, they are to be shared by all the parties, which means I have to replicate this data everywhere else. Every time I do that, it's cost me enormous amount of CPU. Ergo, power. Ergo, data center space. Privacy is nothing but cryptography. Cryptography is a massively computer expensive, intensive process. So I use a lot of CPU, my processor, to encrypt and decrypt, and encrypt and decrypt, and manage keys. Also a high process intensive work. So I'm going to use more CPUs, I'm going to use more power, more data center space. Consensus is basically nothing but me chatting, depending on the model that I choose. Is that okay? Is that okay? Is that okay? That chatting has to happen at the more number of members on the network, means more people chat. When you chat, it's not the WhatsApp chat, it's the algorithmic uh, chat behind the scenes, you basically are consuming network I.O. and computation power because the algorithm runs every time you compute something. More processor, more power, more energy, more data center space. Smart contract, nothing but business logic. When you run logic on the computer, the CPU, the central processing unit, Handle the logic. Hence, more power, more CPU. More. So collectively, it's a perfect storm. Collectively, all these entities are massive computer intensive resources. So justification of saying that, look, this is the investment. This, this is at a very low, this is at the ether level, at the hardware level. Then I have to have a software stack. Then I have to have the skills, which is very hard to find in today's world. Collectively, it creates a it creates a massive sort of bloat in terms of cost of justifying. Those, those, those projects. From what we are doing from that perspective to address that is, we've released a few things. We've released a service for DevOps, your question about REST-based access or SOAP-based access, to give you a standardized way to deploy blockchain without understanding the esoteric elements of blockchain, without understanding the science behind it, without actually ha having to go to MIT and burn this massive, uh, because these are, like, literally, I had to read this paper 16 times, I couldn't understand the hell out of it. But it's so complicated in terms of that. So. But I have to understand it because I have to explain it to somebody. So I have, I have no choice. But we don't want our clients to go through each one of these. Sort of, so we want to give choices. And so by giving the ability to use pluggable consensus takes you, takes you away from expending the people resources and understanding it. We are relying on consortiums, industry consortiums, to, to define what's the best algorithm for that use case. And if that definition is available, if somebody has, if the industry has done the work, all they have to do is plug it in, right? 
And by giving you a few clicks, we give you a network, we want to give you a software stack, we want to en enhance developer productivity. So you are focused on solving a business problem and not dealing with the, the low level elements of blockchain. So for that, we've done a few things. We have a developer sandbox where developers can kick, quickly kick off and expect the app and create their next iteration on top of that without knowing the underlying principles of blockchain. And then we're looking at what we call as high performance business network. This is for the regulated industries, financial services, healthcare, retail, who will require, which they require today. So if you are financial services, in, behind the scenes, you need HSMs, hardware security modules, crypto accelerators. You need all these fundamental infrastructure to begin with, only because they've been proven and time tested, and C certified, for example, <coughs> X certified. So you have all these cert certification certified environments there. And by the way, we are using the same tech in those four boxes. So <coughs> by providing high uh, high security business networks, we are telling our our regulated industries to say, you have <coughs> an environment that you can safely run your projects without actually having to worry about these 15 compliance requirements, especially for, you know, we work with federal government, they have FIPS, and the FISMA is for, for, for financial services. All these standards require you to have certain basic foundational infrastructure. By giving our clients that foundational infrastructure, software stack, developer stack, you suddenly are sort of making some black box, right, and providing support, which means when things go wrong, you know where to call, and by hyperledger providing the standard, making the skills cheaper in the industry in the long run. Standardization does a few things for us. It's basically, we don't. Right, you have standards, you have sense. Am I done? Just about. Okay, sorry. <laughs> we'll, we'll continue this conversation. But the whole point is, when you standardize these things, we do it. Right. So that's basically providing some of these elements. This is what I've been doing in the past 18 months. All my job is client facing. We, I spend all my time with clients, taking the use cases, figuring out what the compliance requirements are, what the regulatory requirements are what technology do we apply and if it makes sense for blockchain. So we're doing this garage, we're doing the design thinking to our clients and spend the two days in creating a business blueprint, what goes away and what parties don't exist in this business network, mapping technology that I've been talking about to that business blueprint and giving our client a path to say, this is how you should go about doing it, which mitigates risks, gives them a full viability and visibility of the process. And at, in some cases, after two and a half days, we said, this doesn't make sense, you can't do it, it's too expensive. Like we worked with one client, he had 60, 21 integration points with one of the nodes. You just couldn't do it. It was too expensive for us to implement blockchain in that world. So we just had to scrap it. We said it doesn't make sense for you. So even though there is this appeal of the boardrooms like, yeah, we should do blockchain on this, when you actually open the kimono, you realize that this is fairly messy for us to take it as is. Which means you either change your business model or join a network that's meant for it. And with that, I will leave it up to I'll discuss the use cases later. No, that's right. Next that's time. Right. But thank you for your time. Sorry, I just spoke too much. No. <laughs> thank you. Very much.